Welcome into another edition of the Future Sox Roundup. My name is Elijah Evans, and I am joined, as always, by my co-host, Jeff Cohen. Uh, we are a little behind today. We're doing something different. we got a few different things going on. Uh, we're going to catch you up on all the latest news. Um, and then we have a really cool interview in the second half of the episode. We're welcoming on Dusty Dellinger, who is a uh, works in the Major League Baseball umpire's uh, office. And he kind of does a lot of different things that we're going to get into later. And you'll get to hear just a little bit of the inside uh, of a mind of somebody who works uh, in the managing aspect of, of umpires around Major League Baseball. So we're going to talk about the automated ball strike system and kind of, you know, his job and just the elements of being an umpire in Major League Baseball, which will be a really cool kind of second half of the episode. Uh, But first, we're going to start with a little bit of a recap, run through the system, uh, talk about everything going on in the White Sox farm system, because there's a lot of good stuff and we're we're coming up on draft season. Uh, There's a lot of talk about the draft within less than a month from now. Uh, And then we've got, you know, the trade deadline right after that. So the next two months are going to be loaded and we have a ton to talk about. Uh, First of all, Jeff, how are you doing today? Doing good, Elijah. You're right. We do have a lot of talk talk about some interesting promotions, uh, concerning injury, a um, couple of hot bats, a lot, lot to cover. Yeah, we got a lot. It's going to be fun. Um, so we'll start here. We'll go through the records of the system. Uh, you know, last week we had RM Leighton on, which was a great interview. Everybody should go check that out. That was a kind of a good way to, to learn in depth about some of the top prospects um, from a guy who really knows his stuff. Uh, but today, you know, we haven't done – we haven't gone through the system uh, and the records in a few weeks now. So, so we'll start here with the records. Um, Charlotte enters this week at 28 and 40. Um, you know, it's really just a, a taxi squad to a degree, right, Jeff? We've talked about this all year. Charlotte is just players are bounced up and down there all the time right now. Um, you go down to Birmingham, 39 and 24. Great season overall in Birmingham. They still have their ups and downs. Uh, cool to see with Birmingham. Their, their expected numbers are even higher than their actual record, right? Like that team is, has a, a plus 100-something run differential this season. And like they should be even better than that, but they are still leading um, their division in the Southern League at 39 and 24. Winston Salem is 29 and 34, uh, going down to Kannapolis, who recently clinched the Carolina League title for the first half of their portion of the Carolina League. Uh, their division 39 and 23. Just Kannapolis has been since since the beginning, since the first few weeks, right? They, they've just been unbelievable. Uh, they're now going to be a playoff team for the first time since 2018, which is really exciting. Uh, going down all the way to the Arizona Complex League, 11 and 20 from the White Sox Arizona Complex League. A few good things there, but you know, definitely not the best results so far there. And then the Dominican Summer League team is three and six so far, nine games into their season. Um, so, you know, uh, some good things across the board, some teams struggling more than others, but generally a lot to like with the White Sox farm. Uh, and we've got plenty of stuff coming up uh, that is going to bring even more excitement to the farm system. We'll start here, though, Jeff. We'll start at the Major League level. Um, White Sox second-ranked pitching prospect, Drew Thorpe, made his debut last week and then made his second start of his Major League career yesterday on Sunday against the Diamondbacks. Two totally different starts for Thorpe, Jeff. Um, you know, your, your major league debut, nerves were running. He didn't even have his best stuff, but only one earned run across five innings, four strikeouts, pretty solid stuff. We liked what we were seeing from him. The changeup was really sharp. And then yesterday in his second career start, got knocked around. Uh, seven earned runs allowed for Thorpe, not a single strikeout, five walks, which is just something we don't see from him ever. Um, so it's, it's weird to see, right? But uh, what is your just kind of general sense of, of Thorpe's first two major league starts now? Well, I got to tell you, Elijah, um, I'm pretty busy with Charlotte, Winston, and Kannapolis, and I really don't get to watch many yeah. uh, Birmingham games. I've never seen him pitch on um, MILB TV, but I did watch his first start in Chicago, and man, that was impressive. That was just I agree. I th- it's just great. That changeup is deadly, and he he had pinpoint control that game. Um, yeah, I was just curious to get your thoughts on his second start, which I did not see, but statistically yeah. was a pretty rough one. Yeah, I didn't get to watch it at all in person. I went back and watched some of the clips yesterday. Um, you know, like you said, the first start was really encouraging. Uh, what I saw from him was a guy that was still clearly a little nervous, but was doing everything he needed to do and was not getting barreled up. He didn't give up a single barrel in that first start. Uh, generally speaking, was just limiting contact, uh, was just doing everything he needed to be doing, right? Um, and then yesterday it was... It was weird. I mean, the pitch mix changed a lot. He threw over 50% fastballs yesterday, which is just not the type of pitcher he is. That, that's what confused me about that start was that I just don't – this is a guy that you're going to need – he's going to need to mix and match everything, right? Like he needs to, he needs to be the guy that is heavy with that changeup. He's mixing all five pitches in at different times and he's confusing hitters, right? Like that's what he drew Thorpe needs to be to succeed. And yesterday just didn't like to, it didn't look like he was being himself, honestly. And then that's what kind of confused me to a degree. I was like, I want to see him 
really lean into who he is as a pitcher. And it didn't feel like that's what he was doing yesterday. And that's something where I'm just like, I don't, I don't love that, right? Like I want him to be a, a guy that doesn't throw the fastball more than 30, 35%. He's not going to be able to get away with it more than 30, 35% because it is low nineties, right? And it's not a ton of movement on it. And it's all about the location for him. So, you know, it, it wasn't great. Um, am I super worried? No, I, I think it's just going to take some time. He, he's again, this is a pitcher who, he relies on confusing hitters and mixing and matching and just moving things all over the zone. Yesterday, he didn't have his stuff. He didn't have his command. He had five walks. We've never seen that from him in the minor leagues. I don't think he's ever walked more than three hitters in the minor leagues, honestly. Um, you know, that that's something completely foreign for him. So I, I think you need to see a little bit, you know, more command. And he just needs to figure out what pitches he's going to use and when he's going to use them. And kind of as he grows, it, it's going to be a learning process. I, this isn't a pitcher who I think is going to dominate right away. But I'm not worried about Thorpe. Uh, he he should be in the rotation all season. Uh, I don't really care what happened yesterday in terms of his long term outlook. Right? We'll see. I, I want to give him like five starts before I start to really make true assessments on on what we've seen from him so far. Right. Now the other uh, prospect who was in the rotation in Chicago is Jonathan Cannon, and he's been really effective so far. Yeah, it's interesting, right? I mean, Cannon, he came up initially, right at the same time as Nestrini. He had that rough, he had a good first start and then a really rough second and third start. Since he came back up, uh, Cannon looks good, man. I mean, he he looked really good um, his, his last start, right? He threw last, this past week, he threw seven innings of one run ball with seven strikeouts. Um, I mean, he was excellent. So Jonathan Cannon, uh, for a guy that, you know, doesn't have the same prospect pedigree as a Thorpe or even as a Nestrini, right? Like, he looked really solid. He came back and he pitched out of the bullpen his first game after coming back up, looked good, didn't give up a run in three innings, then makes a start five days later and gives up one run across seven really, really good innings. Um, so exciting stuff from Cannon. Uh, I'm looking forward to seeing kind of where things take him because he he looks good. He looks like someone who, you know, could belong in this major league rotation. And both Thorpe and Cannon, in my opinion, should stay in the rotation. There's no reason for them not to. We'll see what happens when a Clevenger comes back from injury, right? I mean, that's whatever right yeah. that's what we keep saying like i would like to see these two in the rotation the rest of the season and i think they both deserve a chance to do that yeah yeah absolutely and i guess you know they gotta get clevenger in the rotation and hopefully he performs well so they can move him in a few weeks but um sure but yeah i mean i, yeah, I don't think I mean, there's any return but not, at the there, expense so. of, not at the expense of thorpe exactly thorpe and Canada, no maybe at the expense it. of uh flexen Sure. I'm fine with that. I, I just, yep. I don't, we're, we're too late. It, it's, it's the middle of June, Jeff. Like we're a week, we're a little over a month out from the trade deadline it, right now. Mike Clevenger's not getting anything in the trade market. So what is the purpose? I, I don't really think no matter what he does over three starts in July, I'm not really sure that changes anything. They couldn't get anything from him last year when he was pitching well and he hasn't even pitched well this year. So it's like, <laughs> I, I don't like, what is that yeah. doing? I, I don't yeah. know. I, I just, I think the white Sox have trade chips right now. That's the thing. Like they have, you look at a Luis Robert and a Garrett crochet and even if you don't want to move those guys or if nobody meets the offer for those, you still have an Eric Fetty and a Michael Kopech and a few other relievers, right? Like they're Tommy Pham, right? Paul DeYoung. I mean, there's guys that are going to get a return at the deadline. Yeah. Why are we forcing guys who probably won't even get anything other than maybe one little flyer, right? Like best case scenario for Clevenger or Flexen is you get one little flyer for them. Like I'd, I'd rather just give that month of innings to a Thorpe, to a Cannon, whatever that might be, right? So yeah. Yeah. it's fine. It is what it is. Um, but I think these two both uh, mixed results, right? Thorpe is a really rough game. Cannon had a really good game, but they both have shown me that they deserve a chance to stay in this rotation. And um, I know you're pretty disappointed that um, two other young guys, John, uh, Leisure and Nestrini, were sent back to Charlotte. Yeah, so so Jordan Leisure and Nick Nestrini, both that from that Dodgers trade, um, you know, both guys that we've had on the show before, uh, are both heading back to Charlotte, both back in Charlotte pitching there now. Um, you know, it, it's it's tricky. There, there's there's give and take, right? Like I get. I get what's happening. Nestrini has not pitched well. He, he's pitched at the major league level. He did get a handful of starts, you know, since getting recalled. He, he's made some starts, right? He got, what did he get? I think he got four starts with the White Sox since getting called back up um, and, and did not look great. Uh, I'm not going to sugarcoat it, right? I think, uh, shout out to our guy, Dylan, who I think Dylan's going to be writing a piece on this soon, I believe. But um, Dylan Barnos at Future Sox, he, he pointed out to me, sent me a few videos of how Nestrini's release point on his breaking ball versus fastball is drifting right now. And you can see that his mechanics are just a little bit off and he 
doesn't really look comfortable to the point where he's not releasing those pitches at the same point with his arm angle, which obviously is trouble. Um, generally speaking, in, in Major League Baseball, if you're releasing your pitches at a different point, you're going to be in trouble and hitters are going to pick up on that and you're going to get hit pretty hard. Um, and that's what's happened with Mastrini. In addition to just not being able to command the fastball, and that's the biggest thing with him is when he can't locate his fastball, he gets really reliant on, on those off-speed pitches to the point where they just become predictable. Um, and it's just easy to kind of pick up on that pattern, right? So, but the, the weird thing for me is like he had his best start in you know a month and then he goes down I, I just the timing of it confuses me i get it because it was for thorpe um and in that case i, I can understand that right but at the same time it, it's this weird thing with the white Sox where they decide to bump guys down right after they do well and it just it, like it wasn't great that one start wasn't great he had five walks in that last game with the white Sox, but he only allowed one run across you know four and a third innings and five strikeouts as well so it's tricky. It's going to take some time. I think Mistrino will be back up after the deadline. There's no reason he shouldn't be back up. Um, it just has been in an, an unfortunate rookie year for him uh, up and down. He struggled when he's been in Charlotte. He struggled when he's been in Chicago. It just hasn't been pretty for him overall. I still really believe in the stuff. I really do. I think he's going to get a shot the rest of the season uh, later in the year in the rotation. And then, you know, if it's still not working, maybe you look at him as a relief pitcher next year, potentially. I don't think you want to do that yet, but I think his stuff is going to play at the major league level. It's just about figuring out how it's going to work. Um, and then the other side, Jordan Leisure, that one just confused the heck out of me, Jeff, to be honest with you. Um, yeah, he gave up a grand slam, like a walk-off grand slam against the Mariners a few days ago. Uh, yes, he hasn't been great in June, but this is a guy that had a 2-3-1 ERA in all of May uh, in a bullpen that's frankly terrible. Um, he was still, even even with his recent struggles, he's still one of the two or three best options in the bullpen. I get maybe you want a little more strikeout stuff from him. You want a little more flair from him, right? Like with his stuff, his fastball slider, it hasn't played as well as you'd hope it would have in his first two months in the big leagues. But the bullpen's terrible, and, and relief pitchers like what is it? What is a relief pitcher learning in Charlotte? I mean, it's a park where the ball gets out no matter what, and there, there's not. Once you're an MLB reliever, like, and you have the stuff to be like, there's really not that much to learn in the minor leagues. And I just, I, I don't get it from leisure. What, what did you? What was your take on that kind of? Yeah, that one stunned me. Nostrini, I mean, I, not even though I didn't like it, I understand it. He's been yeah. struggling, yeah, and same. especially based on what you said, he really has to come back to Charlotte and tweak his mechanics. But Leisure was was doing just fine, and I mean, my gosh, I mean, Kopech himself was blowing lead, you know, late games left and right. right. So if you got a problem with Leisure, just take him out of the high leverage situations, bring him in in the fifth and sixth inning, and let him work his way through these issues. Yeah, I, I don't get it. I just I think with relief pitchers and, and you look at the bullpen. I mean, what the White Sox bullpen is atrocious, right? Like the bullpen up top to bottom, it hasn't been good. And Leisure's still been one of your better arms out there, even with his recent struggles. So it's like I, I'd rather, like you said, I'd rather just let him work in lower leverage and see what happens. But it is what it is. Uh, they'll both be back up later this season. I, I really do believe in both Leisure and Estrini long term. I just think it's it's growing pains and, and it's tough and it can't be easy to pitch on a team that has under twenty wins in in June, right? Like that's. And I, we, I know we can't make excuses, but like that's, that's it's a hard situation to go into in pitches or in play as a rookie in general. Right, right. right. Um, then the last guy, uh, or the the next guy who is a potential starter in Chicago this year is Sean Burke. Um, you know, we talked about he got off to a great start, his first start, and then he had he's had a couple of rough ones. But uh, the Knights are back in town this week, so hopefully I'll get a chance to watch him in person. And, uh, hopefully he'll bounce back, but. Um, couple of rough starts for him. Yeah, it's it's learning, right? I think, I mean, Burke, it's like, yeah, it was exciting to see him in his first start in Charlotte look really good, right? But at the same time, like, he's coming off of a significant injury. It's been a little while. Like, I, I'm i not expecting him to be a perfect immediately, right? Like, it was great to see him throw eight strikeouts in that first start. But then the last two starts, you know, two runs and three runs, respectively, four strikeouts, then three strikeouts. Like, it's not, it's not, he's not getting blown up, right? But at the same time, he's he's got to get back in the rhythm of pitching every week and pitching at, at a high level in AAA, right? Like, he went yeah. from, Arizona in the rookie league immediately to triple a. So that's like, he didn't, they didn't bother putting him through Winston and Birmingham. Cause we've seen him succeed at as high as triple a in the past. Right. But like, it's going to take him some time. I still think his stuff is lively. Um, do I think with the depth right now in the situation that Burke is a long-term starter? I'm not sure, to be honest with you. Um, I, I can see kind of with some of his command issues, I could see him being a really good reliever. I mean, that, that fastball curveball can definitely play at the highest level. So I, I think there's a lot to like with Burke. I just think you got to give him some time. Let's give him a full month in Charlotte to really settle in, to find his groove. And then from there, we can look at him and post deadline and say, you know, this is a guy that should get some innings at the big league, whether it's starting or relieving, whatever that may look like. Yeah, absolutely. 
Then the um, last uh, move was uh, Duke Ellis, and I think most people who've been following the White Sox know that he, he was promoted from Birmingham to the Major League Club, and he got in a couple of games, and then then he um, was then they DFA'd him, I believe. So uh, we just yeah, wanted to get did. your thoughts on, on on all those moves and if they surprise you, yeah. they make sense to you. Yeah, I mean, Duke Ellis is, is tricky, right? I think it's like he, he's a fun player. His speed is unbelievable, and you saw that in the few games in Chicago. Ultimately, he's probably not a big league player, um, I think, at least right now at this point in his career. Uh, I don't think he's a, he's a big league player. I think he was really there because, you know, Benintendi was out and because Pham was out. Like, it was more of a, you know, let's spice things up and let's get a speedster in there and see if he can steal some bags and change the course of the game a little bit here and there, right? But he's not a big leaguer right now. I mean, you see him, his numbers in Birmingham are pretty pedestrian this season, so I, I don't think... He's. Pro- I don't. I think he'll clear waivers. Hopefully, um, I know he got DFA'd yesterday. I'm yeah. hoping he clears waivers and returns to Birmingham or even even Charlotte, maybe. Right? Like, let's yeah. let's see it in the minors a little more. But um, ultimately, this is a guy that like speed is great. He plays some good defense in the outfield. I don't know if the hit tool, the bat, will ever really become impactful enough to be a big league player. Um, but I think I hope he. I hope he stays in the organization. Definitely. Um, he's he's a fun player to watch. That's for sure. Um, and, and then I'm- yeah. There's no, one stat I, about him that I want to point out. I was doing a little research when they DFA'd him, and I, and I saw that in his minor league career, he's 117 out of 133 stolen bases. Oh, that's, yeah, I mean, that's crazy. That's yeah. ridiculous. Yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah, that's not, enough, not enough for a ticket to the major leagues, but still pretty impressive. Yeah, that's pretty nuts stuff right there for sure. Um but no, I mean, it's, it's, it's exciting. Um, but, uh, you know, moving beyond that, we got, we got an injury to talk about. This one's unfortunate. Um, I wish we didn't have to talk about this, but you know, Grant Taylor, um, is, uh, has looked really good. We were talking to him to arm about him last week. Like this is a guy that we're incredibly excited about, um, goes down with an injury. Sounds like it is nothing too serious. Um, but at the same time, it's, it's a little troublesome, uh, because Taylor was off to such a good start coming off of Tommy John, um, has looked in incredible this season touching you know 90 plus right 99 this season i think he hit 100 many different times this year so taylor is someone that that we're excited to see and now he's gonna miss some time uh, how are you feeling about that how concerned are you uh jeff from hearing the news about taylor's injury well you know he's such a high upside pitcher one of maybe one of the top two or three in the system so it's very alarming of course and um Again, Canapolis is home this week, so I hope to get up there and maybe find out a little a little more about what's going on. But you know, it, you're like you say, he's he's coming off um, you know the IL and uh, just, yeah, hope hope what they're saying is true that it's just uh, you know mild and he'll be back soon. Yeah, that's yeah. that's definitely the hope for sure. Um, I think he'll I think he'll be all right. It sounds like it's a lat strain uh, of some sort, right? So it's they're going to be careful though. That's the thing. Like you don't want to rush this guy. There's no reason to try and push him back. I, I'm not sure if he pitches anytime. I don't know in the next month or two, uh, just because there's no need to, uh, you got to be patient with him. There's no reason to try and, you know, push your luck with him. Um, but I think at the same time, like I, this is a guy we're, we're pretty, you know, we're pumped about. So let's, I'm not worried. Should be fine. Uh, let's give him the rest he needs and I hope to see him back out there soon. Uh, heading down to Birmingham, um, going to that level from now, um, you know, per usual uh, dominance, right? That, that that starting rotation is just <laughs> unbelievable. We love what we see from them. Uh, the recent addition to that rotation, though, that I want to mention is Tyler Schweitzer, who we were, you know, when when we were speculating that Thorpe is probably due to get the promotion soon, it was like, oh, who slots in, though? They've already brought up Noah Schultz, so they've got that five-man thing working, but they're being really careful with Schultz. They're piggybacking him with another starter every week. Um, so in general, it was like, who's going to take the spot? In Winston, there wasn't anybody really excelling, but Tyler Schweitzer had a really good few starts prior to the Thorpe call up um, and gets the call as, as an older guy, as a guy with a little bit more experience than some of that Winston rotation. And and what does he do? He, he just absolutely shoves uh, to start his Birmingham career. Um, I know you're a fan of Schweitzer and have been for a while. What if, what if you kind of, you know, does, does this make sense for him to be in Birmingham already? And he clearly looks like he can handle it. You know, the last time I saw him, I think I saw him like two or three weeks ago in Winston. And, it, and I think he also went seven innings that game, just like he did in Birmingham. I mean, his last three or four starts, both in Winston and Birmingham, have been excellent. Excellent. Yeah. I mean, in this yeah, start, I mean, two hits and one walk and eight strikeouts. You know, yeah. it's insane. 
against a pretty good Pensacola team too. Not not a team that is a that has struggled really. A team that's been pretty good at the double A level. So it's a it's great to see. I mean, it's just the, the pitching the pitching in Birmingham is unbelievable. It's almost like guys get there and they just become even better than they already were. Um, and Schweitzer's a talented guy. I mean, you look back at his he got he got lit up pretty hard on May first. Uh, and since then, you know, he's made six starts, five being in Winston, one being in Birmingham, has allowed the most three runs in any of those games, has max two walks in any of those games, one or zero in most of them. He's been really good uh, since the beginning of May. I mean, he started his season a little bit shakier, but really over the second, you know, second, his last six starts has been excellent in general. Um, and now is in Birmingham and looks like he can handle Birmingham. Uh, beyond that, in, in Birmingham, the rest of the rotation still continues to shove, right? They continue to dominate um, top to bottom. Noah Schultz got hit around a little bit in the first inning yesterday, but then immediately settled in. Uh, you know, everybody, everybody's everybody been good, right? Mason Adams with another really solid start this week. Give up a few runs in one inning, but a bunch of ground balls. Kai Bush was excellent yesterday through a seven-inning shutout yesterday uh, before the game got went into extras and they ended up losing. But just – really exciting stuff. And the one guy I want to mention particularly, Jeff, is Jake Eater. Um, I've kind of been watching the last Jake Eater start. I tuned in and watched the majority of, uh, I was able to catch kind of the, the majority of his last start. And oh man, uh, Jake Eater looks a lot more like the Jake Eater that we were hoping to get last year and a lot less like the Jake Eater that wasn't healthy last year. So okay. this is a guy that, you know, I, I know I like what Kai Bush is doing and I like what Mason Adams is doing. But when I look at this rotation beyond Noah Schultz, I still see Eater as the second highest upside arm uh, behind Schultz in that rotation right now. Um, I think it's it's not he's not as polished, and he still has some issues and some things to work out. But Eater now his last three starts, uh, what is that? Twenty five strikeouts across his last three starts two walks in each of those three starts, right? So the walks are, are still higher than you'd like, but they're coming down and they're getting to a reasonable rate. Like you can get away with two walks a game. When you get to that three, four point where he was earlier this season, then you're in trouble a little bit, but you know, two walks in each of the last three starts, at least seven strikeouts. He struggled against Tennessee in one of those games where he just got hit around a little bit, but you know, two of his last three starts, right? When you look at those starts separately, right? He may, may 31st. And then this past week on June 13th, six and a third in that first one, three hits, no runs, then six, innings three hits one run on a solo homer 10 strikeouts eight strikeouts in the one before it, the stuff is playing with eater um it, it's not perfect but i'm really really intrigued and excited by what i've seen from him in the past month or so yeah definitely a different guy than last year definitely the guy the white Sox thought they were getting when they traded yep. for him absolutely yep. yeah and yeah. uh you know this is, we've had about, I think the season has gone on about 10 weeks now. So the minor league starters have all had about 10 starts and, um, you know, based on what we've seen from Eater and Bush and Adams and Iriarte, it's, it's they're all just trending up. It's just so exciting. Yeah, a few rough starts from Jairo Iriarte lately, um, but generally speaking, not worried about that. I still am very encouraged by him all season. Um, just good stuff. That rotation is phenomenal. Uh, before we move on to the lower levels, um, we got to move things along here, but I do want to talk about uh, Mr. Edgar Caro, uh, Jeff, <laughs> Mr. Edgar Caro. Um, like this is the guy it's it's funny to see because he's been a little streaky right edgar carroll had a really rough month of may but now we're seeing in june what we saw in april and even better so we saw him start the season hot he had a rough stretch throughout may and now we see him you know in, in june just tearing the cover off the ball his last fi his last 12 games for caro uh last 15 days so since the second day of june caro has a 12 34 ops four home runs in that stretch only seven strikeouts to five walks nine more rbis he still leads the southern league in rbis 18 hits across those 12 games uh, for an on-base percentage just under 500 um it's just been unbelievable to watch caro uh, and i think he's gotten to the point where like we got to consider him being in charlotte this year right yeah, absolutely. So uh, I got an easy an easy quiz for you, Elijah. This one, I think you can do this in your sleep. Over the last thirty days, four Birmingham hitters are hitting over three hundred. Who are they? Wow, four over three hundred. That's that's pretty good stuff right there. Um, right. Caro is going to be one for sure. Um, he's been unbelievable. Um, Tim Elko has also been excellent in yeah. the reigning past few days. He's just been uh, phenomenal, really, all, you know, throughout. Tim Elko, like, we got to give Tim Elko credit as well. Before I answer the rest of this question, like, after a rough April, um, and it was kind of like, oh, is this guy just kind of capped out in Birmingham? Like, is he going to reach that? He has been phenomenal. Um, I, I don't know what he's, what is he, what is he hitting in the last 30 days? It's got to be really three something. Oh, my gosh. 358. 
there you go. Uh, Elko has been exceptional. Um, Brooks Baldwin has to be one of those as well. Yeah. Uh, Brooks Baldwin, even though he's for his standards has slowed down uh, moderately compared to what he was doing earlier this season has still been just really good all season. Um, and then I'm going to go Jacob Gonzalez. I think, yeah, right? absolutely. He's been yeah. all yeah. Jacob Gonzalez has also been great. So those four have been excellent. Um, Wilfred Varis has also been pretty good. He's had a few big home runs lately. Still some ups and downs for Varis, but that lineup is fun. That lineup, those four yeah. have definitely been great. Um, Gonzalez is someone that, you know, we, we, we talk about it many times. Like this is a different player than what we saw last year. He made a lot of adjustments this off season and he looks like the first round pick that the White Sox drafted last year. Um, and, and looks better than I expected him to, to be honest at this point in his career. So really exciting stuff from that lineup, um, led by Caro of late, but Caro, Elko, Baldwin, uh, Gonzalez, all hitting really well at the top of that lineup. Uh, Varus as well has been solid. So exciting stuff. That Birmingham team is, is really fun. And, and most of those guys are going to be 2025 big leaders probably, right? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, I know we need to wrap up here in about a minute. So I'm going to, no, we, got a, we, got a, we got a, we got five or 10. We're good. Okay. I'm going to rapid fire just a few shout outs to, to, for some guys who are doing really well. Yeah. Um, one of them is Tommy Vale, who uh, stepped into the rotation in uh, to fill in for Grant Taylor and he yeah. his first start five uh, shutout innings. Um, so shout out to him. Also in, in Kannapolis, um, a red hot bat now that uh, he's out from under uh, Galaney's shadow is Caden Connor. And yep. uh, he's hitting 306 for the year, 383, 443 uh, slash line, uh, having a strong, strong year. I um, also want to shout out to Lenin Sosa, who looks like he's getting comfortable in the major leagues. I was going to say, we're going to have to take some time next week to talk more about that and see where he's at next week. Cause Sosa, I put, made a post about him a few days ago on Twitter. He, he looks like he's really finding his groove in the majors. Um, but we'll stick with, with Winston and, and Kenny for now though. Um, in general, those guys are all important to mention. Caden Connor is someone that has been good all year. Um, I did a great interview with him. It was cool to get some insights from where he's at in his career. Uh, he should be in Winston, right, Jeff? I think that's pretty fair to say. I think yeah. this is a guy who played college for four years. Like he, he, he should be in Winston soon. Um, I think same track as Galaney to a degree where, like I just don't think he really has anything left to prove in, in Kannapolis. He's facing guys two, three years younger than him. Like, let's get him up uh, to Winston. Generally speaking, though, um, the, you're right. There's a lot of good arms. There's a lot of guys that have been thrown well. Billy Seidel was also promoted this past week. Uh, went from Canny to Winston. Uh, has been a great bullpen arm all season. And when and Canny, like we talked about, there's a lot of guys in Canny that have been pretty strong at the bullpen there. Um, and now Seidel will get a chance in uh, in Winston as well, where they could use some more pitching reinforcements um, across the board. Though, pretty pretty good stuff there for sure. Sure. Anybody um, else from Winston? I think you, I think you wanted to uh, talk a little bit about uh, Samuel Zavala. Yeah, Zavala is worth mentioning as well because – uh, Zavala, you know, highly regarded prospect, uh, exciting piece, right? We like, we've talked about him all season. Like we like him, but he's, he's had a rough start to his season. Uh, but at the same time, Zavala is starting to pick it up a little bit and, and not necessarily with, uh, the impact at, at the bat to say, to say that, but, but he's getting on base a lot. Uh, Zavala over his past 15 days has a 500 on base percentage due to 14 walks across those 12 games, 14 walks in 12 games, only seven strikeouts, stealing some bags, getting some hits. Uh, it's good. It's been good from Zavala. It's fun to see him start to kind of figure some things out. I think this is a guy that's still really young, 19 years old. He's got plenty of time. He's, he's at high A already, you know, as a 19 year old, like he can be there all season and we still have time to give him, you know, to see if he figures it out even further, but really good stuff from him uh, the past few weeks, at least, you know, he, he looks like a better player in June. He looks more comfortable. He looks like he's taking better at bats there. So good to see Zavala start to kind of tap into some of his upside there because we we're really high on him. And I think he's, he's the highest ranked prospect probably in that Winston lineup. Right. So even though he's only 19 and he hasn't been great this season, we're starting to see a lot of the signs of, of Zavala, what he did last year when he was with the, the Padres organization still. Okay. And then the other guy in Winston who uh, just got promoted from uh, Kannapolis is Ryan Galaney. Cut off to a little bit of a slow start, but it's worth pointing out he had two home runs last week. Yeah, he's starting to look more comfortable. I think it's yeah. only a matter of time for Galaney. I mean, we saw what he was doing in Canny. He was the best hitter in all of single-A baseball to start the season. Um, and now he's in high A. Give him, a, give him a week or two, and now he's starting to find that groove, tap into that power a little more. Um, I think Glaney will continue to hit there and tick up even a little bit um, and should be, you know, there's other guys in that lineup as well that should kind of join him uh, in that trajectory too. Well, Elijah, I got a thousand more questions for you, but I guess we'll, we'll have to hold until next week. We'll do a few more. We got a few more minutes before this interview with Dusty, so we can we can do a few more. What else you got from those lower levels? 
Well, I wanted to get your thoughts um, on Peyton Paulette. Have you seen him yet this year? I have not. Yeah, I, I've watched a few starts of his. Uh, I didn't watch the last one. Um, it, it hasn't been great for Paulette. I, I think this is a guy that you know we were really excited about coming off of last year. He looked healthy at, towards last year. Right, last year was all about getting him healthy, getting him in his routine. Um, and now it just it's just not quite clicking for him. The command isn't there. Um, the stuff isn't quite what we thought it would be either, to be honest. I mean, the fastball was really lively when he was coming out of college, and the assumption was always that it would kind of get back to that point. Um, unfortunately, it just isn't moving quite enough. Uh, the walks are really high. He's not generating the whiff. We, we kind of hoped he would be generating at this point in his career. So it, it's tricky. Um, I still am, am excited about Paletta. I think he could be a piece, but... It's, this is kind of feeling almost like a lost season at this point. I'm hoping it's not that case, and I'm hoping he can start to figure some things out. But Paulette is a guy that I think next year you could be looking at as a potential move to the bullpen uh, and seeing what happens from there. Um, it's just the, the command hasn't come around yet, so we'll see. It just you got to throw strikes to be effective, especially you know at the high level. Like this is a guy that should be able to throw strikes on a regular basis um, and just hasn't gotten there. He, he got pulled in the first inning of his start this past week. So some good games here and there, right? Like he had, I guess he had a pretty good stretch the last three games before of this past week. Uh, the command wasn't great, but he, he had one run, no runs, one run, um, three starts before this past week, and then gets pulled in the first inning. So it, it's, it hasn't been great, but I, I still think Paulette's going to get starts the rest of the season and we'll, and we'll see if he can progress from there. Yeah. Yeah. Sounds good. Yeah. Um, Kenny, uh, just to more mentions there generally, like that roster is incredible. Uh, shout out to Canapolis for clinching that division title for the first half. Um, up and down, it's been exciting. Um, George Walcow is a guy worth mentioning, right? Like it's, it's, it hasn't been great. This is a kid who's the guy who's 18 years old and it's going to take him some time to, to find his groove. Um, I think most people thought he'd be in Arizona pretty much the whole season and, and he's been in, in Canapolis already now for, for two weeks and he hasn't played every game necessarily. But with that said, uh, a lot of strikeouts and definitely a lot of whiff for him, but two home runs already for Walcow, both of them that were absolutely clobbered. Um, so I, I've got, I'm excited. It was cool to see that uh, a week ago or whatever that was when he hit his second home run that was just demolished. And it was like, wow. So we've seen the upside with him. Um, he's going to be there all season. Uh, we'll continue to see him uh, progress throughout the year. I'm sure. Yeah. We know that uh, both Walcow and Ryan Burroughs are both really highly, yes. highly pedigreed prospects. And they'll figure it out and they'll get going. You know, they're just off to a little bit of a slow start now, but uh, it'll, it'll, it'll click. Yeah, exactly. Um, all right. Well, we are going to take it away to this interview uh, with Dusty, who is going to give us some insight on MLB, the world of umpiring um, and all this other stuff. Uh, but we'll be back next week uh, for a full, you know, breakdown we're going to go even further in depth throughout the whole farm system it's been a little while since we've really done you know every single level throughout the whole roster type of thing so next week will be more of a, of a dive into the entire farm system uh, we'll talk about some acl and and dcl dsl as well get into some rookie ball type stuff next week as well uh, but for now we're going to turn it over to our interview with dusty We are now joined by Dusty Dellinger, the Senior Manager of Umpire Development for Major League Baseball. Uh, we are super excited to have Dusty on just to talk a little bit about the world of, of umpires in baseball, um, how you know the ABS system has worked and, and everything in between there, just uh, about his work um, and just the baseball side of things. So welcome, Dusty. Good to have you. Thank you for having me. We appreciate you taking the time. So um, Elijah, um, Dusty and I are often sitting together not in the Charlotte Knights press box. I've gotten to know Dusty. Whenever there's an umpire question or controversy, everybody in the press box turns to Dusty. But I also just, every, any chance I get, I quiz him about his job because it's so fascinating. And at some point I said, you know, we got to get you on the podcast. And, and this is good stuff. You know, people are people will be fascinated to hear what he has to say. Definitely. Uh, I'm excited to hear what he has to say because I've heard from you a bunch of interesting things. But, you know, this is a it's a hot topic, right? I mean, Major League Baseball, a lot of people have varying opinions on on umpires and whether it should all be automated or partially automated or whatever all that means. Right. Um, in addition to the fact that you've been doing this for a while and you, you know kind of how the world works. So, uh, first of all, Dusty, what is your kind of your, your life path? Where did you you know what? what how did you get into this world uh, and where did you start from there? Yeah, it's uh, it's crazy how people get into the umpiring pr profession. Um, like most of the umpires, uh, we, we have a playing background. Um, I had the opportunity to go play uh, D2 uh, baseball. And um, quickly, uh, my, my sophomore year, you know, uh, I had gotten hurt. And um, I was sticking around to, for summer school that year. And uh, this gentleman came out and 
asked if I was interested in umpiring uh, uh, Little League. So uh, I was like, you know, I think we were getting at that time like $15 a game. There was a time limit. And uh, I was like, man, I'm going to get paid to be out here on the on the field. And <laughs> I just really became fascinated with uh, just that side of the game, learning the rules. I thought I knew the rules coming up. I mean, playing college baseball, thought I knew the rules. Uh, and just really became fascinated with the job and um, the, the challenge it presents, right? You know, it's uh, – you have to be perfect from day one and get better, as we say in the, in the business. And uh, so I pursued that during my college career. I just kind of made some extra money umpiring. And um, the, the older gentleman that I w- would be umpiring with, uh, they saw that I had a strong passion for it. And they encouraged me to go to umpire school once I, my college career was over. And um, I did. And I'm, I've been doing it ever since. So I'm starting my 27th year in professional baseball. And um uh, I'm just, I'm truly blessed uh, in the job that I have. And I continue to do something that I've done ever since playing T-ball and um, transition right into it. So nice. That's kind of yeah. how I got my, kind of my start into professional baseball. So, yeah, very cool. And um, how much um, umpiring did you do in um, major league or minor league baseball? So I worked, uh, I worked 11 seasons um, and worked five, my, my last five years were at the AAA level, and my last three years I uh, was uh, part time uh, at the major league between the major leagues and AAA. So I was a call up umpire. Um, so I worked about forty games over those uh, seasons, and um, you know it was it was a great opportunity. Uh, you know, loved it. But we were going through a time. Um, I don't know if y'all remember, kind of going back, dating myself a little bit. Um, you know, the umpire. Um, the mass resignation that they they uh, employed back in 1999, where there was a uh, we had 27. Uh, well, actually, it was 22 umpires that had resigned uh, during that failed, uh, uh, I guess, CBA. They were in a CBA uh, negotiation or, or or whatnot. And um, so, anyway, we lost a lot of veteran umpires that that year and. By the time that season was over, there was 27 new uh, AAA umpires working at the major league. So we went from a lot of older umpires moving out to a lot of younger ones moving in. So we went for from about 2000 to 2009. There was only four umpires that were hired. And wow. since 2010, we've probably hired close to 45 to 50 umpires. So uh, you can see that there was kind of a, uh, a slow period. And, and I kind of fell in that in, in that period. Um, so after the 07 season, um, just like players get released, umpires get released, and uh, but they called and told me I was released. But at the same time, they 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 knew my passion, they knew my love for the job, um, and they offered me an opportunity to work in, in umpire development um, as an instructor, evaluator. Um, I didn't at the time I wasn't really thinking in that in that way uh, to pursue that opportunity um but after not going to spring training and uh, uh doing something for 11 years being married and i think my wife was uh she was like something feels weird here you know you're you're at home in uh in april so uh she knew that i was missing baseball and and we we talked about it in in may of that year may of 08 um, um i started working in umpiring development and uh been doing it ever since so nice very interesting it's cool kind of how that how that path goes with the ups and downs and you know shifting as you go and just kind of taking things one step at a time right it sounds like and uh how do you so once you've been in umpire development right what is an umpire how how does umpire evaluation work because i think a lot of people have an idea that probably is inaccurate what does it mean for an umpire to be evaluated on a regular or consistent basis right so you know, a lot of things, you know, people think it's it's all about judgment, right? And and everything on the field. But, you know, no. it, it, it's changed through the years. But I mean, we're looking at, at how they handle themselves, not only on the field, but off the field. There's a lot more responsibility um, in today's game mm-hmm. um, and how we operate uh, in the umpiring world. Uh, there's a lot of administrative uh, responsibilities the umpires uh, have to manage um, their travel, um, you know, hotels, airlines, uh, getting from city to city. So there's a lot of responsibility that we, that we put on, uh, these young men and women to travel and, and, and be at the next, uh, next assignment, uh, week after week. 
And um, so we're constantly evaluating them in that regards. But then, you know, we're obviously looking at them on the field as well and, and how they perform uh, and how they they're progressing uh, through our through our system. Um, when you talk about evaluation, you know, often things like what are you what are you looking for? Right. So I think the biggest thing we look for is their, just their, their attitude, right? How are they going about doing their job day in and day out? It's a long season, as you as you know, baseball is uh, the number of games that we have. So it's it's a grind. You're you're working through the summer months. You're working through the heat. Um, so it, it's really that attitude, that coachability. Or are you do you have that passion? Do you have that drive to get better? Um, so we're looking at their effort, their attitude, their hustle, their mobility, their professionalism their presence on the field, how they carry themselves. Are they taking charge of situations and, and handling people, right? I think umpiring is, is, is kind of a, it's a people business, right? And relationships and how you can communicate with the players. How can you communicate with the managers? Obviously we have tense moments during the course of the game. How can an umpire diffuse that? Is he going to be uh, approachable? Is he going to be able to diffuse situations or is he going to be confrontational and make the yeah. situation worse? So these are a lot of the things that we look at, you know, when we talk about situation management, we talk about conflict resolution, you know, those skills that umpires learn through their, their time in the minor leagues and, and the experiences that they have. Obviously rules knowledge, no one's the ins and outs of the rules. That's one thing that, that, that has changed drastically since my time on the field is this, all the new rules that we have. Right. Um, and, and I, you know, I'm kind of the old school. Um, so a lot of the new things, um, I, I remember when we talked about putting the, uh, the runner at second base, uh, I heard that in 2016 at, at the winter, uh, at the baseball winter meetings and I about fell out of my chair. But then, uh, then after, after seeing it one year, I was like, no, nah, I like it. It's, it's a great rule, you know? So I really became after that, I really became open-minded to a lot of the changes. I was like, look, we gotta, we gotta try this. And, um, I really like the approach that um, that Major League Baseball is taking. Um, they're really getting buy-in from all the stakeholders in the game, you know, the fans, uh, the players, the, the managers, the organizations, the umpires, everybody involved, uh, the stakeholders. They're, they're really getting complete buy-in and um, with all these changes. So, uh, so anyway, that's I know that was a lot, but uh, no, no, that's great. There's, there's that's all, great. There's intel. a lot of different components that we're that we're looking for uh, so when evaluating you, these umpires. You say uh, you say buy-in. I'm curious. I want to I want to poke a little bit at that and, and get your take on this. But you know, there was a lot of mixed opinions. Uh, what was it a year and a half ago when when the pitch clock and, and the you know the amount of step off rules and all these new rules right. have now been implemented to to kind of speed up the game, right? right? What was the initial reaction from the umpire side? Because I think we've heard players that I think most players liked it, but I think there's definitely been some players that have said they don't love the pitch clock and other things that that came in in the last two years. What was the initial reaction from from the umpire? Uh, around those new kind of speed rules? Well, if we go back a little bit, we were actually um, kind of the guinea pigs with the uh, with the pitch clock regulations started in, I believe it was 2014 or 2015. Now, the regulations at that time, there was a lot of loopholes in those regulations, and uh, I think the players quickly uh, figured out how they could manipulate those regulations. And then um, – and then in, in probably, what, two or three, maybe four years ago, we kind of recrafted. Uh, and it was actually when we, we had the integration with minor league baseball, major league baseball. That one of my first jobs was to um, work closely with the on-field group with, with the new regulations that we, in fact, have today. I was closely involved in the initial regulations as they were formed. So I got to work closely with that group in, in some of these, uh, trying to tighten up these loopholes. Um, of of the of the original regulations to what they are today, and um, so the umpires, uh, I think they were a little uh, apprehensive at first, uh, but just because we knew where we came from with the initial regulations and the loophole. But once we found that we were that we were tightening things up, and that we were really um, getting a lot of feedback from the umpires, and and how we can make things better. So we were constantly having, um, you know, probably monthly calls with all the umpires, getting their feedback and like, hey guys, how can we, how can we make this better? How can we tighten it up in this area? Where are the players taking advantage of the rules? So we did all that um, 
you know, uh, in, in that in that first year of the rollout before we rolled it out to the major league. Um, so, uh, so I think the umpires really liked it because, and then first of all, they saw how quick the games were moving, yeah. you know, the pace was picking up, right. Which in turns obviously has an impact on, on the times of the games. So they really liked how the flow and the feel of the game, you know, it was actually moving That's a lot fun. quicker. There was a lot of down, you know, the downtime was kind of out of the way. So they had to be thinking a little bit quicker. Um, so the umpires, the umpires loved it. Yeah. Great. Speaking of um, new rules, let's um, let's get into the ABS a little bit and see uh, what kind of feedback you're getting from the umpires on that. I think the umpires, uh, they like it. Um, I think initially there was, you know, the, the technology, right? And, and there was some changes to the to the size of the plate, the up and, you know, the width of the plate has changed from when we first started ABS, um, how we determined the bottom, top and the bottom of the zone. I think that part of it was um, where the umpires were kind of most challenged, right? You know, we didn't know exactly if it was how it was going to change and, and where it was going to be. But I think once the umpires know where it's at, and this is what I tell them in my conversations, because we're constantly in the locker room talking about ABS, right? So um, I know how good the guys are. When they, have, when they have the tool to go back and look at the game afterwards and analyze their work, through uh, through the new ZE system that we now have at the minor league level, it, the ZE the zone evaluation has always we've had it at the major league level for many years. Major league umpires can go review their work, they can look and find their trends, and see where they're if they're calling a pitch you know a little too off the, uh, off too far off the plate, um, you know if they're if they're too aggressive off the plate or uh, you know not aggressive at the bottom of the zone, they can see their trends. So now we have that tool with our with our triple A umpires and even our low A umpires in the Florida State League. But I've told the umpires, once you know where the zone's at and you have this tool where you can go back day in uh, game after game and review your work, you're going to be you're going to be fine. Um, I had the opportunity when I was working on the field. This was, um, you know, in the early years of this zone evaluation, it was actually called the Quest Tech uh, system back then. It took me about four or five plate jobs to really find out where um, I was struggling. I worked through my whole career and now I'm in triple A and I'm on this technology and I can see where I need to make my adjustments. It's just like a hitter, right? And and player development has had all these resources available to them for many years where the umpires yep. have it. And, uh, you know, we finally have gotten there. It's been a long, long time coming. But um, really excited, excited to to see where we go and, and watch the improvement. We've already looked at some of the numbers from previous seasons, and we've already seen improvements with our AAA umpires this year compared to last year with their accuracy of, of the strike zone. So um, again, once we get it dialed in, get the technology completely dialed in, work through some of these little small glitches that we have, I think the umpires can be fine. That they, for lack of a better word, they like they like the challenge. You know. Yeah. That's that's so fascinating. You just alluded to this, but I think it's interesting to to put into perspective that it's like it's almost evening the playing field between players and umpires in a way where players have had a way to reevaluate themselves and their game mm -hmm. for so long, and now you have that side of the umpires where they're able to evaluate themselves and, and work on their craft almost right. Like right. it's almost a practicing mechanism now where it teaches Absolutely. you to be a better at, at your job, right? Absolutely. So, so um, you know, in Charlotte, Dusty. Excuse me. You know, we we use we have two different forms of the ABS. Three days a week, it's just pure ABS, no challenges. And in the last three days, the umpires call the game, but can be challenged by the hitters. Is there a preference there by, among the umpires? Um, I, I think the umpires prefer the challenge system. Uh, I think yeah. they like the traditional of, of of calling pitches and and doing doing their job. Um, I think they they find themselves in those full ABS games becoming a little too relaxed um, and not as you know mentally locked in. I think it's it's a tell of two two uh, two games, right? You got your your first game, your because you're working a six game series, so you your first plate job is full ABS where you you're kind of mentally a little more relaxed, where you really have to be spot on for your next one. So um, we're actually looking to make some changes. I don't know if you're uh, aware of this, but we're going to be moving to uh, uh, all challenge uh, here, uh, not this week, but next week. Um, so we're going to go to all challenges the remainder of the season. 
um, and in the International League, we'll be going to uh, two challenges. And to, instead of three, Pacific Coast League will stay at, at three challenges. So we're going to do some testing there. Um, so uh, look forward to that. I think the fans, I think everybody, all the stakeholders, as I mentioned earlier, really prefer the challenge system. You know, we've looked at the numbers. Um, I think I think the, the full ABS actually kind of falls at the bottom. I think if you, if you look at it from challenge system or the traditional umpire call the game, and then the full ABS, I think the full ABS is, is at the, at the bottom of that. Um, so, but the challenge mm -hmm. system, it just, it just brings a new element to the game. The, uh, you know, those high leverage pitches late in the game, it just brings a level of excitement. And we, Jeff, you and I are there in Charlotte. We can, we've, we've seen it, we feel it. And, yeah. uh, it, it's, 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 uh, it's a different element to the game. And, uh, I think it's, uh, hopefully we'll, we'll see where it goes in the future. Um, yeah. So, and, and from a player perspective, like you said, like that changes the way you approach it at bat. And that's something that we've talked about from a few different White Sox players that we kind of have circled in that you notice guys that have really good plate approaches, right? Like if you mm -hmm. trust your instincts and you know that you're a smart hitter and you can have a really good knowledge of the zone, you don't have to have that approach of, you know, fighting off the third strike, right? Like that's such right, a common right. old school baseball thing that you hear of like guys exactly. where it's like, you got to fight the pitch if you think it's anywhere close. If you know the zone, yeah. you don't got to fight anything. If you know where yeah. the ball is, you don't have to think about that, right? So yeah. it's an interesting dynamic for, for players and, and umpires alike. You just kind of said it a little bit, but what do you see the future of, of the ABS thing? And I think it's interesting that you like the challenge system. I, I love the challenge system. I think it's so right, much fun right. watching a game and being able to see a guy say, hey, that I think that's a ball. Um, but right. like, where do you see that going in terms of Major League Baseball? Do you see a path to it soon? Do you think it'll be a little bit longer just because of the kind of pushback on it? Uh, you know, it's, it's hard to tell. I, I think, um, I think we've invested a lot in, in the system and, you know, it's, it's showing signs of, of positive feedback from, again, from those stakeholders. So I think, um, I, I think if as long, and now this is not my area, but if the technical side of it, if we, if that can get locked in and, you know, there's, uh, assurance there, um, I could see this happening pretty quickly at the major league level. Yeah. Um, I don't want to put a timeline on it, but, uh, right. but I, I think it will, it will definitely be tested and um, you know, whether we go into spring training, testing it and, and seeing how it works, but obviously it's, it's proven pretty positive here in the minor leagues. Yeah. Cool. Let's talk about uh, the, the recruiting part of your job. Uh, yeah. I, I was joking around with Dusty. I think uh, last homestand, I said, you know, tell me about the off season. Turns out there really isn't much of an off season because you're out recruiting all the time. Yeah, well, during the season we we've we've kind of changed the model again since we've integrated with uh, with Major League Baseball. It used to have the traditional; it was kind of kind of pay for play. You had to go to umpire school. You paid you know four or five thousand dollars to go to umpire school, and then you were hopefully you were so selected out of your respective umpire school to uh, to attend the minor league um, minor league baseball advanced course. Uh, but since we've integrated, Major League Baseball has really invested a lot of money into umpire development which has been great to see. And now we basically have a, a four week uh, prospect development camp down in Vero beach, um, the old Dodger town uh, facility, which works out great for, for our training. So that's kind of our home base now uh, for umpire development. And um, so we do four weeks of training uh, there. We'll bring in anywhere from 50 to 60 umpires that we recruit throughout the season. Uh, once a month, we will uh, make stops throughout the United States the different places we'll, we'll uh, we may be at an urban youth academy uh, academy or a minor league ballpark or major league ballpark we uh, we just wrapped up our second camp out in las vegas a few weeks ago uh, we we did our initial uh, we did our initial april camp in vero beach and we'll be going to kansas city here in june uh atlanta in july and st paul minnesota in uh, in august uh and we actually did make a uh, we had a mini camp down in dominican um recruiting some of our uh, Latin American umpires. Uh, a lot of the umpires come over from Venezuela and some other Latin American countries uh, for, uh, for a mini camp. We had 50 attendees at that camp, and we'll probably have four and five of those uh, come to our January camp in, in Vero Beach. So that's where our pool of talent is um, collected from at these various camps, one day, uh, one day camps or clinics that we do. And then in January, we have our four-week program 
And like I said, we'll have 50 to 60 candidates there. We run them through uh, basically the fundamentals of, of umpiring. Uh, we're teaching rules about half the day. And then the next half of the day, we're out on the field teaching the mechanics, positioning, and all the uh, intricacies of, of umpiring. And uh, so I spent my, my whole January in, in Vera Beach uh, at our basically our rookie training program. Uh, once we, we finish that program up, uh, we, we rank all the umpires, 1 to 50, 1 to 60, whatever it may be. And then we'll place those umpires accordingly uh, based on the number of jobs that we have for the upcoming season. Very interesting. That's, that's fascinating stuff right there. Typically, how many do you uh, hire each season? What's the, what's the turnover like and the advancement from level to level like? Right. So over the last, uh, say, 26, 27 years, uh, we average about 40 umpires a year. Now, since we've had the integration um, and we've had a new collective bargain agreement, uh, the minor league umpires uh, have had a collective bargain agreement since 2001. I know the player development players just had their first collective bargain agreement. So the umpires uh, have had theirs for some time now. Um, but once we, we integrated with Major League Baseball um, during that first year, uh, the new CBA was uh, renegotiated. And again, Major League Baseball has made that investment. Uh, they put about $1.5 million uh, more into the uh, into the program, uh, trying to get the salaries up for the umpires to make this job a little bit more attractive for, for young folks. Um, and it's paid off. We've seen the numbers, our retention, uh, umpires uh, not resigning. Uh, we used to have a lot more off-season and in-season resignations. But now I think the, uh, the work environment has become a little bit more tolerable. Um, there's still a lot of travel. There's no home games for the umpires. But having the Monday off days and some of the other nice benefits that come along with the job, having your own hotel room, um, you know, those things, uh, you know, they're attractive for someone trying to get into the business. So, uh, so anyway. Definitely. Uh, one aspect that I find pretty interesting just from from being a baseball person and watching baseball all the time, uh, how do you negate the factor of, you know, team preference or just, you know, hometowns or wherever it might be, right? Because obviously it's an, it's an impartial job. You have to have, you right. kind of have to remove that barrier, right? So how do you kind of account for where people are from and how they grew up and teams they ended up cheering for when they were younger and all those such factors? You know, you know once, you, once you get in the business, um, yeah. the, whole, the whole fan part of you – you know, we always grew. We all grew up. You know, I was a Cincinnati Reds fan, right? You know, I'm part of Cincinnati through all the minor leagues and and worked in the major yeah. leagues. And that that fan part of you, yeah, just it it, it just leaves you. Um, I th and and that's I don't want to get too much into the to uh, to that, but you, you see, you know, you see the good and the bad in individuals, right? Yeah. When you're out on when out on the field, you know, we're we're grown people playing uh, playing a kid's game but sometimes the behaviors and all that stuff. So um, I'll just keep it at that. The fan part of you becomes removed and the impartiality. I mean, you got to be, uh, you know, I tell the, the guys uh, that come to school, uh, we talk about um, the, our, our saying is uh, your judgment may be questioned, but your integrity should never be. So, um, you know, you got a job to do and we're under a microscope in today's, in today's game with, with social media, with, with all the technology, cameras everywhere. So you have to, you have to go out there and, and, and do your job and do it the best you, to your abilities. No, definitely. That makes perfect sense. I think it's interesting you say that because I I've told this to Jeff before, but even in even in two years of doing, you know, prospect coverage, I, I've already kind of felt a degree of, of working in the game, pulling away from the fandom side and the, and right, the passion right. side. You become more of a you become more you know, focused on your job and, and the analysis right. aspect yeah. rather than the, yeah, exactly. It's, it's an interesting yeah. dynamic for sure. Um, you guys, uh, people don't realize what a beating you guys take behind the, um, behind the plate. And I know you've told me that a lot of umpires, you know, they're, they're on the, in, in effect, the, uh, injured list for part of the season. Because right. of that. Yeah. We've, we've had a, uh, we've had a rough go here in the first couple months of the season. Um, We've got several. We've got eight umpires that are on our injured list right now. Um, our medical team um, and facilities are out in out in Arizona, uh, so we ship all of our injured umpires. They're out there, um, either doing some rehab or or seeing our medical team. Um, but our biggest injury that we have is is concussions, right? So we've got 
Um, of the eight that are out there, we have five that are in concussion protocol, and some of them have been over three to four weeks out there uh, trying to recover from from head blows. You know, I think about the time when I was coming up, we just didn't have the the knowledge of of the damage that was being caused by, you know, taking foul balls and, and fastballs directly to the mask. You know, uh, we knew it hurt, uh, and yeah. it hurt for a while, and you were kind of shaken up, but we didn't know the the after effects that the problems that it could cause. So uh, we've obviously become more educated with that in, in all sports. And um, so we take it serious with our medical team and um, our athletic trainer who works day in and day out. I work closely with, with him each day. That's how I wake up is communicating with him mm-hmm. to see what our injuries from the night before and how we're going to fill our holes. If that umpire is going to be out, we're going to have to move an umpire up or we're going to be able to use a local substitute for a day or two. So we're always analyzing and having to work on logistics and getting umpires different uh, different places. Yeah, very fascinating. Um, I think that's all we got for you, Dusty. We uh, we really appreciate you taking the time. It's super fascinating for me. I, I think I, I always kind of wonder about the the layers of, of umpires in the league, and I think fans can be too harsh on them sometimes as well. So right. I know you've probably dealt with that plenty in your time. Oh, um, absolutely. But yeah, we, we really appreciate the insights, and it's super interesting to see and kind of the, the future. There's a lot of developments on that front of things. So I, I'm looking forward to seeing where things take us, and it's uh, it's cool to hear especially about the challenging system because I, I, right. I love it, and I'm, I'm yeah. very much hoping that becomes part of major league baseball in the near future so yeah really appreciate the time thanks for joining us and hopefully i'll see you out in charlotte sometime later this year all right thanks elijah jeff good talking to you you too see uh, you this week